It's my distinct honor and privilege to moderate tonight's conversation with two of the authors of the Clue Train Manifesto, David Weinberger and Doc Searle, and among all of you, for which it's uh, an incredible brain trust in the room, I'm eager uh, to open it up as quickly as possible. Uh, let's so let's take a minute. How many people have read the Clue Train Manifesto? Wow. <laughs> now, maybe I should stop for a moment and define read. There's a kind of read that is the back of the book, and kind of flipping through, and then maybe looking at the Wikipedia page or read a review of the book. How many people have done that, at least? Okay. How many people have actually read the book the way we meant read in the 20th century? All right. Still a lot of people, for those of you in uh, Cyberland, uh, that say they've done it. So it's going to be a very um, uh, in-depth conversation. But for those who haven't, help us out. First, paint the scene <laughs> 10 years ago. What did it look like as you were gathering together to actually pen a manifesto raging with, I don't know, a cocaine-fueled late-night <laughs> in the writer's room. Present company accepted. Against yeah. what were you raging? What was the situation 10 years ago? I think that um, it, the main thing, at least for me, was that the net was not well understood. That the net, and I think the net is still, to some degrees, not understood or you wouldn't have written your book, <laughs> you know, The Future of the Internet and sure, How to Stop cool. It. So, so there's, that's still there. There's some, there's some misunderstanding of the net. The, uh, th there's parts of it that I don't think we fully knew even what we were saying, even though we said it. So, so for example, um, not, uh, not long after the book came out, I was, uh, I was on a little show on, a, uh, on, the old, on an old TV network that's now gone with Jacob Nielsen, uh, and afterwards, he said, well, you know, you guys were marketers who defected from marketing and sided with markets against marketing and pointed out that we were using the second person voice against marketing, basically against, against the machine, as it were. We were saying, uh, you this and you that. And, and in and fact, we. even clue train, like you don't have a clue, is a sort of, there's a kind of element of smugness well, to it. Right? Yeah, well, we, were, we were siding with buyers. We were siding with, with, with citizens. We were siding with with society, with individuals, and, and for that matter, with, with companies that weren't necessarily that well-funded. And, 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 and we, we actually felt, that there was the, the line that galvanized it for me, and I, I, it probably did for David as well, was one that Chris Locke sent out. It was a little gif that said, we are not seats or eyeballs or end users or consumers. We are human beings and our reach exceeds your grasp. Deal with it. And, and I didn't even realize until later when Jacob pointed that out that you know, who is the we we're talking about? You know, who is it that our reach is exceeding your grasp? Who are we? Who are you? And we were ordinary folks, and you were the people misunderstanding us mm -hmm. and misunderstanding the net as well. And we felt that the net had enormous potential beyond just IPO scores. And that's basically what the play was for at the time. So I think to answer your question, um, the, the, the crash took care of some of that. And, and, and the net has, in fact, completely changed a great many things. We're, I don't think any of us would give it up at this point. I think that there, I mean, if you, if you were to, you know, take any one of us from even 10 years ago, or 15 years ago, and put us in now, we would say this is kind of utopian. Hmm. You know, we, we have a lot more, you know, we're getting the net on our phones, we're getting it, uh, you know, through data cards. It's, it is relatively ubiquitous. It is highly available in a lot of places. It now is undermining the phone system. Uh, the phone companies that we hated are kind of blowing up. Um, there are institutions we liked, like newspapers that are kind of collapsing. We're seeing some consequences there. Um, but it's been it's terribly disruptive, and, and goodly disruptive, too, I suppose. And I guess part of dividing the world a little bit into them and us, with the us and the we, the people being the former little guy that had been perceived by those in power as mere eyeballs or right. things that could be easily manipulated. Now the sheep are standing and <laughs> they're not wanting to be shorn anymore. Um, how, how does this fit into your, your view about authenticity? That somehow there's something oh, real God. about... Mm -hmm. This is voice. This is the voice <laughs> point. I know. David's groaning. Oh, oh, no. <laughs> this is one of the things I think we were wrong about. Ah. So, so thanks a lot. Yeah. <laughs> um, 
So uh, uh, I believe you mean that sincerely. <laughs> <laughs> so tell us. No, I do actually mean it. Yeah. Um, so I, uh, I think that I still think that the, the web is um, disruptive, exceptionally so. It's not simply another communications medium. That this is the age of the web, and that says uh, I still think it's as important as the age of the printing press. I mean, I think it's epically important. Maybe I'm wrong about that, but that's one of the, one of the premises of clue training is this is really, really important. There is this element of anger that you're pointing at. And I think this is one of the, I'm going to get to your point in a second. I think this is one of the ways in which the clue train is dated. The tone of it is now uh, angry middle-aged men who feel released from um, their upbringing, which was dominated by broadcast and, the, you know, the con you know the, it's oppressive. Broadcast was an oppressive regime. Today's youth, the digital natives or whatever, you know, don't have that. It's not an act of liberation to step into the uh, into the internet. It's simply what is. So the angry tone of obnoxious, angry tone of and smug tone of Clue Train, which was very effective for it at the time, apparently, I think, is now um, out of out of date. I don't think we would write it the same way um, anymore. The problem with authenticity is um, I, I, this is a really really hard hard point. And, I, and Chris used. Chris used to say, and I suppose still does, that, uh, that corporations can't be authentic because they, well, I'll channel Chris Locke, Rage Boy, because they can't fuck. You know, they don't have bodies. They're just, they're not real things. They're, and I think there is a strong element of truth. <laughs> Your anti eunuch screed must have gone over well. <laughs> not to be confused with the plural eunuch. Yes, 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 of course. <laughs> <laughs> All right. um, and this, this is one of the, so, we sometimes, Doc and I sometimes are approached by uh, happy, excited marketing people who say, oh, you co-wrote Clue Train, I love that book, it's so important to me, and then they tell us what they're doing as marketers, and the blood drains from our face, like, oh my God, <laughs> not, oh no. This is like that cartoon, <laughs> Becca, do you have the cartoon up? Yes, it is, it is like that cartoon. <laughs> yeah, right. that the social media for marketers, how about if I deceive people authentically, transparently, and passionately? <laughs> yes, yeah. Um, Sincerity is the most important thing, if you can fake that, you've yeah. got it made. So I want to say two things, yeah. both brief and contradictory. The first is that the notion of authenticity is extremely difficult and dangerous. Um, it's difficult because corporations aren't people. It's dangerous because it can be used to um, make you feel good about what you're doing in your, without it having any substance. So there's a certain danger to authenticity. Um, but the authenticity also does capture something that we do want to capture when we talk about companies or people, which is we can, there are times when we want to say about somebody that she or he or the company itself is completely inauthentic. They're lying, they're self-deceptive, or whatever it is. It's a useful term, but there isn't a lot of metaphysics behind it when you start pulling it apart. So I, it makes me very nervous to hear authentic, authenticity raised because it is an important value in the Clue Train Manifesto because I now think it's mainly just this sort of grab bag of stuff that doesn't resolve into anything real. And so it makes, makes me nervous. When you I don't know. agree. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I think that the, uh, what we said about voice, um, and that was, that was all David and Chris, I should say, uh, um, and, and possibly Chris especially because he has such a distinctive one. Um, to a large extent, the tone of Clue Train is Chris's tone. Yeah. Um, uh, is I, I think we're still I think we're experimenting with that right now. I think with what's happening with with Twitter here. I think what's happening with what's been happening with blogs since since Clue Train came out. What's been happening with with the web in general um, is uh, with texting for that matter. I think that and I don't know if it's, if it's authenticity. It's human. You know, it's it's just it's part of. And, well, and the net is inherently, you know, a human place. It's, so let's yeah. take Twitter as a case no, so study. I, I agree with all that. Okay. Like, yeah. Uh, can I ask yeah, 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 sure. Yeah. So what's Procter and Gamble's authentic voice? I mean, that's the thing that I, 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 I just don't I, know. Well, he, he, here's, here's what I think. I mean, I, and this is, I think there is a place in the world for things that only big companies can do. And I think that uh, Procter and Gamble makes stuff that other companies can't make. Um, I think what, what Peter Drucker said, you know, 50, 60 years ago about in the long run, companies will exist at the grace of their employees and their customers, and that the customer will come to the center of, of the corporate stage is still inevitable and hasn't quite happened. Um, I think a lot of what we were saying, what you said about Fort Business, which is, I think, one of the strongest things uh, in the book, um, 
is true. I mean, I think what you know that, that Fort Business will be is, is an obsolete um, conceit of an old regime that cannot survive in a world where everybody's connected and community. And just for those uh, who haven't read the book, Fort Business. This is a, what's the luggage at the other end of that handle? So it's my handle. I'll do it's the his luggage. handle. Um, the idea is uh, uh, businesses that confuse themselves, building a business or building a fort, where the walls of the fort are intended to keep information away from customers. So the technique, uh, and markets in general. So the technique that companies traditionally have used is they were the best and sometimes the only source of information about their products and their services. So they would collectively release information in order to control their partners, their customers, their employees. In the age of the net, the walls are a mere mockery because we're all in touch and we're all, there are no, basically no secrets. So you think so. you can't really cultivate a brand separate from the truth? <laughs> Uh, well, that's another thing that's wrong in these. Uh. It's like I thought Morningstar Farms was rolling hills and like, you know, mm -hmm. fake pigs walking around from which you make the fake bacon, right? That's how it <laughs> happens. It's not? I don't know. And, and California cows can talk. No, yeah, that's so great. Yeah. Thesis number 70 something is forget about advertising, it just yeah. doesn't work anymore. 74, forget advertising, advertising, forget about it. It, it, it doesn't <laughs> work. It's so totally which is, wrong. Which but by totally advertising, wrong. maybe you just meant blatting out of a megaphone right. that works to really a stadium well. full of people. Right. But if by advertising what you, or, or the, the counterpart, the replacement, advertising 2.0 is the much more insidious cultivated authenticity of the blogger who gets sent free equipment yeah. and an expectation yeah, that he'll yeah. review it or something. But they still get exposed. You know, it's, we it's, don't know that they do, though. Right, we it doesn't can't matter, know. really. Yeah. It doesn't well, matter. I mean, it, I mean if, if if you sell out that seat, so what? You know, or live with that. I mean, it, it doesn't. That doesn't concern me. What What happens to companies does. I mean, there's a, there's, you know, companies now have to live in a world where ev where there's zero distance from everybody. And in fact, we all live in a world where we're, if we're on the net, we're all zero distance apart. And the cost of being being able to communicate is very very low. Mm -hmm. um, and that makes all the difference. There, the there's a high cost. To, to keeping information away from customers. Um, there's a high cost even to keeping information away from competitors because you can improve your market by revealing information off yeah. to competitors. And we're just beginning to learn there's some stuff that does need to be trade secrets. Some of them do have to be kept out. You know, Publicly Apple held company can't just no, you share can't. its thoughts in a live stream. No, but I'm not sure it does all that harm as they do. Well, actually. actually, there's an eBay blogger who does more or less. But um, yeah, no, that's fine. There, there are absolutely there are things that companies need to, by law or in fact, actually need to keep secret. And we have no problem with yeah. that. And we're both totally opposed. I'm going to speak for you, Doc. Yeah. Uh, to the astroturfing and the suborning of bloggers, and that's just evil. That's subverting the most valuable social interaction we have, which is talking with one another. So you shouldn't do that. And if you do, you should rot in hell. You know. Um, that that's that much is <laughs> that's the title easy. of the sequel. <laughs> yeah. The problem with advertising is that there is a type of blaring advertisement, uh, advertisement that blares over the megaphone at the football game, that appeals to the lizard portion of your brain and absolutely <laughs> works. Branding works in the sense that we do, most of us still do, tend to think of the Toyota Yaris as a young person's car because that's what the, even if we're um, and I, I still carry around jingles that I heard when I was five years old in 1955, and th there's not a medical procedure to get them out. <laughs> so this, this stuff I does find that work. pinball wizard trumps all. <laughs> That's amazing. It's, you can uh, use that. I can sing the Eastern Airlines jingle. You know, this is a, that stuff does work, but we now have the ability to it now. <laughs> by Eastern number one to the sun. Wow. Wow. I remember Northwest. It's not, the, the intervals are all wrong, but the general progression is correct. Um, but we now have, and this Few is what people know, David was originally a musician. Um, and Klusan was right about this. It was deeply wrong about some other things as well, though, but it was deeply right that we do now have, as a, as a market and as a culture, the ability to undo some of the damage that the mindless lizard brain advertising does to us, and we can fact check instantly. And when they show, when we're thinking about getting a, uh, a Mini Cooper because it's going to be so much fun to drive, but we're worried about Boston weather, we are not, this is for business. In the old days, you had to rely upon the dealer, maybe a magazine, if you find one, to tell you. 
<clears throat> now you're the last person you ask is the dealer. How does this baby do on the, in, in snow? The dealer's always going to say, oh, yeah, my, my wife drives one. <clears throat> All winter long, it's great. Pardon, pardon for the sexism. Um, so now you're not going to do that. It's gonna, the dealer's sexism. Well, absolutely. So now you're going to go on, on the web, and you're going to find out instantly from people in Boston that mm -hmm. it does or it doesn't. So and from there, you're reason. happy if that's from TripAdvisor or from Car Talk or whatever your favorite forum is, or maybe there's even an Amazon review of the car or something. Uh, yes. Any yes. and all. And, any and all, yeah. Got it. Now, you had had a hook almost into the VRM stuff, and I want to do a, a quick <laughs> riff on that, but yeah. before that, yeah. I want to see Twitter as a quick case study because it is so much the flavor of the month right now, yeah. and I'm curious to see the clue train principles applied to it. <laughs> is Twitter exactly what you were talking about, empowering the little guy in the immortal words of David Weinberger, on the internet, everybody will be famous for 15 people. Yeah, At right. least there's some people <laughs> who want to tune in <laughs> to what you're saying, and yeah. they can do that, and then they can retweet, and they can retweet, and you know, stuff rises to the top. Or is it exactly the kind of modality that can be subverted by the forces against which you rail, and there are such things now as Twitter brand managers that can tweet for you, or there's, uh, what's it called, Twitter lead or something, where you can pile up your tweets for the coming day and have them, <laughs> you know, burped out at regular intervals. Random, random, yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. I mean, is, well, how would you parse it? Uh, I, I would say yes and no. I, I, think, it, I think it's... Uh, uh, it's very much um, clue train esque in the sense that everybody can participate, everybody has a voice, you can tell that the voices are authentic. Um, lots of invention, lots of uh, uh, unpredictability, you know, uh, the hyperlink subvert hierarchy, which is one of David's lines that was uh, one, of the, uh, one of the theses in there. Um, where, it's, where it's not is that it has, it's a silo. To some degree, it's a silo. It, one company is in the middle of it. One company is staying in the middle of it. A um, company with no apparent business model? Is that true? I, yeah, so far. Um, <laughs> but I, I'm not sure. I'm not sure getting continuous investment is not a business model. Uh, <laughs> so, so, I mean, I, I, really, I, I think it is a business model. So, so th th there was a. Not so much for the investors, but. Uh, well, Volume I, I, is how they really Volume, exactly. Like, yeah. <laughs> First interstate bank, we make change. You know? <laughs> how do you make money? Uh, with volume, right? More change. You know, we just had that happen, didn't we, I suppose? Um, the, the, actually, there was, there was a story that was told in the, in the, in the first edition of Crew Trainers and the second one as well. Um, <clears throat> that was pretty revealing. I was at, a, at, at this party, and there was a young guy who, who was on his third startup, and I recognized him, and I said, what are you doing? And he says, well, we're an arms merchant to the portals industry. And I said, well, there's a portals industry? That's an industry? He said, oh, yeah, and we do this and this and this. And it was all buzzwords. <clears throat> and I finally asked him what I thought was a rude question. I said, how are sales? And he said, they're great. We just closed our second round of finance for <laughs> $25 million. <laughs> and, <clears throat> and, I, and it was like this light bulb went off. I said, oh, wait a minute. So every company has two markets, one for its goods and services and the other for itself, right? And what happened in the dot-com era is the second overcame the first. Right, we had this whole market. There's nothing about selling your 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 company. Yeah. So, Twitter's operating in that. Okay, and and it's interesting that you know Evan Williams, who runs it, who's the, one of the founders of it, sold Blogger to Google. What's Google's business model on Blogger? Who knows? You know. So at some point they'll sell for some money to somebody who's going to make. Sounds money an awful on it. lot like a pyramid scheme. <laughs> yeah, it probably is. You know, I mean, it's it's. Uh, Everybody would like to have one of those, actually, you know, and get out before it goes, it goes weird somehow. I mean, it, but, but it, does, it does perform a service, right? And, it's, and I think everything, and this is, this is sort of clue trading too, that, that everything's a prototype. Still, everything's a prototype. Um, uh, and my wife, Joyce, is sitting over there. I just said once, and, and I, uh, one of my favorite lines, which is, trees do not grow to the sky, right? This is not a tree, you know, Twitter's not a tree that grows to the sky. It's not even a tree that stands for very long as we see because it's being turned off all the time. Um, uh, and, and Google isn't either, you know. Google is not the end of times, and like Microsoft wasn't before that, and IBM wasn't before that. Um, you know, everything, you, you can prototype all kinds of stuff on the net as long as it remains open and generative. Got it, yeah. yeah so. All right, so let's do a riff on VRM. Mm. Vendor relationship management. Right. Turning on its head the old style CRM 
by which vendors try to treat their consumers as exactly the sheep-like, eyeball-like little <laughs> faceless <laughs> molecules and then right. send them tailored email on their birthdays and right. exactly for them. <laughs> You're saying, no, let the consumers do that to the vendors. Right. And we don't call them consumers either. We just call them customers. But yeah. there, there was a line we quoted from uh, Jerry Mikulski that um, he said a, a consumer is, a, is a, a dullard that lives only to gulp products and crap cash. And that was in the first book, and he corrected me later saying the dullards with wallets and eyeballs. That made it in the second version, which is <laughs> over there in the corner. But um, yeah, so, so one of my new chapter, all four of the authors have uh, a new chapter in the, in the, uh, in the new edition, um, uh, deals with the subject of VRM, which is, which is what I'm working on as a, as a fellow at the Berkman Center uh, with something called Project VRM. And VRM stands for Vendor Relationship Management. It's a reciprocal of Customer Relationship Management. Cust CRM is, is what sends you junk mail. CRM is what organizes the call centers that you hate, that when you, when you call them, they're sending you off to uh, someplace else. Um, they're making bad guesses about what you want. And what we're doing is turning that around, uh, putting the pricing gun in the hands of, of customers, putting the ability to, to issue a global um, uh, preference in the hands of users, being able to change your um, uh, address once for everybody that you deal with. Uh, uh, basically giving customers control over their interactions with, with, uh, with sellers in the marketplace. And it's, a, it's like everything else on the net, it's early. We've been, but it's, it's something that we've been working on for three years now. The public radio tuner, which uh, uh, Keith Hopper is over there and some other people may be in the room too for all I know, have been working on um, some VRM stuff that is going to be showing up in that. How many people have a public radio tuner on an iPhone? Wow, not bad. You know, for the for record, maybe 40% raise hands. Well, we don't yeah. know how, many how many people have an iPhone? I'm just curious in this crowd. Wow, there's probably maybe. Everybody that said they enough. had a tuner has the iPhone. Yeah, everybody has <laughs> the yeah, public radio tuner. The Venn diagrams are building themselves in my head right now. <laughs> yeah, so, so the thing is that, that, that more and more control is passing into the hands of users. What we want to do is make sure that it's not just intermediators in the middle, where we have the best way of helping you relate. It's rather you have the tools for relating. And it's still early with that, and we outlined that in the chapter. So let's try some of this wisdom in the realm of politics. Do you think we've seen in the past 10 years some of the canons of the manifesto bear out in the political space? Yes. Mm. More? <laughs> <laughs> We're treating the witnesses friendly. I don't know what your problem is. Harvard Law Professors are impossible. Um, Actually, one of the things I, I'm, I'm absolutely <laughs> proudest about with the book is that um, uh, Joe Trippi, who managed Howard Dean's campaign, read it and actually uh, was influential on him to some degree. You know, so, uh, that makes me feel and, very And happy. therefore on the Obama I'm, campaign, too, I would say. Well, yeah, sort of, yeah, indirectly. Um, uh, so you can, we always thought that the clue train was actually about uh, the effect of the web with business as one example, and I think that there are actually a bunch of precepts, of whatever, um, that apply equally to marketing and to po uh, politics since uh, ever since 1968, I think the book was written, and I can't remember the name of it, um, that uh, disclosed that in fact politics was, politicians were being treated like soap and the campaigns were just like marketing. We know that's the case, right? P politics and marketing have become one of the same thing. So, to the extent to which the net changes the nature of, of marketing, likewise for politics. So in the case, to, to not as successfully, because politics is, and government is harder to change than business is, because business will change on almost you know, instantly if they see an opportunity to make money, whereas in politics, you're talking about longer standing institutions, everything goes more slowly. Nevertheless, um, the way I, I understand the Dean campaign, uh, which I take is the formative one in this space. And to which you were a senior internet consultant. I had a very nice title, senior internet uh, advisor, that way overstated my role as a volunteer, but yes. <laughs> uh, seriously, you know. Um, you it, just it, went it, door to door. I did, I did that too, <laughs> actually, yeah. Um, the, the basic idea of it, as I understand it, was uh, you have a, um, a broadcast model in in politics, you have a guy at the top um, who is broadcasting a message down to the troops, and uh, you try to enforce message discipline. This is exactly how marketers talk. Um, 
the Dean campaign wanted to undo that. You cannot do that by reversing the flow for, of the many up to the one, because Howard Dean is not going to read the 680,000 emails that we get a day from his supporters. That's how many people had signed up on his site. Um, so the campaign had this breakthrough idea, which I think is really quite wonderful, which is, well, the way you do this, the way you scale it is by enabling conversations among um, the base of the pyramid. You do it laterally. Precincts. And on the Cohort. net, anybody. Yeah. Cohorts based around any set of interests. So they actually set up a, a social networking site um, where you could go, you could register, state your interest, form groups. There was uh, pilots for Dean. There were educators for Dean. There was even Howards for Dean. <laughs> <laughs> Howard, yeah. um, I joined that Facebook group for a while. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why. So I, um, the essential idea of peer-to-peer -peer conversation as uh, empowering and important and human and as a way of undoing the pyramidal structure as much as it can be done, that was, you do see that in politics more and more and more. We're coming to take it actually for granted, which is an amazing thing, just an amazing thing. And would you see that in the presidency right now? Do you think the executive branch of the United States has taken this to heart? I, well, yeah, I think they do, actually. I mean, not, I'm not saying they took clue training, to, but I think they're taking the web ethos uh, to heart. Um, it, you can see this in lots of, of areas. What do you read from the fact that when they had the first policy quasi-wiki up, I think they used Google Moderator, and people could vote stuff up and down, the top three policy priorities were marijuana legalization, the legalization of marijuana, and pot for all. Yeah. And so, is that... Hey, what's wrong with that? <laughs> who's right there? Is it that that's actually uh, so, the top priority? Uh, you referred to the net as near ubiquitous. Yeah. And even, so <laughs> I'm going to look at, for example, Esther Hargitay's right there at the moment. Um, <laughs> and who at any moment could erupt into a rant about the digital divide. <laughs> or I would look at our, our good friend Ethan Zuckerman, I actually could look at many people here, um, who have, are very uh, persuasive and, and data-based on the point, even more to the point, that no matter how ubiquitous, say, Wi-Fi access becomes, and of course that is becoming more, um, the range of of skills that are required to succeed with it is pretty vast, and that divide is still there, and the uh, globally, it's extremely unevenly distributed as well. So ubiquity is way, way too optimistic uh, right. a term. Yeah. But Esther, is that okay? Okay. Okay. We, it's established. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but but for, for politics, which is where the, what which, which was asking about, I, oh, that's I, I, I was watching, um, because I've been a, a, an editor for Linux Journal for since 96, one way or another. And <clears throat> an interesting thing to me about the Dean campaign is when, when that was going on, um, things like voter rolls and stuff like that were very chaotic. They were on many, many different uh, platforms. Most of them were proprietary. A lot of them were like Excel spreadsheets or Fox bases or old DD2 or some other one thing. Of like one of those old Visicalc. Oh, yeah, that, that crap. Yeah. <laughs> Hi, Dan. Dan Brooklyn, one of the co-creators of this One of the original so. calculators, in fact, here. Um, More responsible for the internet uh, revolution than perhaps anybody else. Certainly the PC of. revolution. Yeah. Yeah. So, thank you for that, Dan. <laughs> we are all prisoners in your cells. What Roman column are you, sir? <laughs> A1. One. Yeah. There is a feature for you. You struck my battleship. Okay, so. So, 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 so the thing is that, um, so, so like Drupal, for example, was, was young there, but things happened on Drupal in the Dean campaign that got, that, that grew and got routinized, and, uh, and I think were actually contributed to the growth of Drupal mm -hmm. to some degree. But by the time, four years later, that the Obama campaign came around, voter rolls were all unified across the country. There was. Uh, uh, and it wasn't just because the discipline was imposed from above, though that was partly it. Mm. Um, it was also because there was a diaspora of geeks that came out of the Dean campaign, mm. and they were connected on the net. It was very clue training in that respect. And, and the out of control nature of that actually served politics very well. Mm. Um, and for a savvy politician like Obama, and he wasn't the only one, there were a lot of others as well, um, there was an awful lot that could be done both in the command and control way, but with the velvet glove, and also in the grassroots way, giving lots of ways for people to participate, or at least sense they're participating, and certainly give money to. Yeah.
Now, we should have our medium and our message yeah. overlap. Uh, it'd be a little weird if we went on too long up at the front about the importance of grassroots yeah. participation. There's so let's start there. easing in to the brain trust. And I'm I just good. If people want to jump yeah. in, uh, please indicate. And feel free to say what's on your mind. Uh, and if you like, say who you are. Or draw from all the stuff that's coming in, either from you or from outside these walls uh, online in various ways. Sir, tell us who you are. My name is Daniel Dern. And use the oh, UN like yeah. My name is my name is Daniel Dern. And the first question for the clue train, I should have sent this email to Chris to ask him as a proxy. Do you feel that the clue train, rather than informing the we, was giving dangerous ammunition to the they so that they could do it to us? And by extension, or as a second question, you can pick and choose. To read the book. <laughs> it's like Scientology. You can't be trusted. With <laughs> well, but, well, and the other question is, given you know, in the, the 2.0 or 3.0 or wherever we are world today, with Twitter and social networks, are we hitting the point, a similar point, either of co-option or, I'm not sure exactly the phrase, but are we, is there a, an upper limit that, for every company that wants to be my buddy, my friend, my information source, this comes back to the Usenet paradox. I have a limited amount of seconds per day, and I have to decide whether to allocate them. And every time I want to listen to you, it means I can't do something else there. In which case, you still want Dan Rather to tell you what car to buy, or uh, somebody who takes his place. Sadly, at this point, I would rather have John Stewart tell me what to not believe. So um, I'll, I'll take part two if you take part one. Okay, I'll take part one. Um, <clears throat> part, part one is do we give ammunition to the enemy, whoever the enemy is. Uh, there are a couple of um, uh, vexatious opponents of clue training, we might say, that insist that what we actually wrote was a marketing book um, and that we are part of the marketing sphere and it didn't matter if we were marketers or defectors for marketing, we in fact gave more ammunition to the enemy, as it were. I don't think that's true. Um, I think that that the the BS detection that we have is better than ever. Um, and if marketers want to continue to send messages at us and they want to say they're clue training messages, that doesn't mean the clue train's to blame for that. It means that they didn't understand it. And uh, so I'm not too concerned about that. Um, and it, one of the ways of reading, to your second point, of reading the history of the internet especially of the web, is uh, as a series of continuous invention, innovation, in how we're going to sort and filter um, what we want. Because it keeps scaling up more and more, hundreds of billions, and more and more coming in. And we still keep managing, because we have to, uh, we keep managing to invent new ways to tr help us try to find what it is that we need and what we want to see. And so we have too many blogs. So. Uh, Dave Weiner comes up with RSS, um, and that gets refined. And there are too many tweets, and so, um, well, there's a natural mechanism of, of, of following people. You can control your list, but still, too many, so now we get... So uh, for every you know, base tweet, of the filters, pyramid, there's some form of filter there's that more and more all comes out in the wash. Yes, and one of the most interesting ways that we've been doing it is, in fact, I think quite a, if I may say so, clue training way. Uh, a lot of these innovations ha ha uh, use social filtering, use our friends and their conversations and their stuff. Dig. Um, yeah, dig is, you know. But for every dig, is there a subvertandprofit.com, which I think is still up and running, Becca, uh, where <laughs> subvertandprofit.com, this is the weirdest shout out to give. Like, <laughs> <laughs> spell it out, I guess. <laughs> Talk about, you know, yeah. solace <laughs> to the enemy. <laughs> subvertandprofit.com, which allows you to tap into the black market of votes on social media sites, and it's one social media participant at a time who's willing to take a buck to dig something yeah. random in addition to all the regular stuff that she digs. <laughs> and uh, Subvert and Profit takes another buck, so it's two bucks per dig. Um, yes. Does that worry you, or you think that'll be outed, or uh, are we going to get into the rotten hell zone again? Uh, well, it's a it, yes, exactly. <laughs> it is the rotten hell zone. We need a special you know, circle. Um, it, I, I think that it will always be the case that we are going to ha we're going to uh, have bad actors who are using the openness of the net in order to, uh, to their slimy advantage. 
because the alternative is that we shut it down. We have strict authentication schemes. You do have to take a test before you get on it. You turn off the generativity <laughs> of your devices. This is, I now owe you a nickel because this is clearly your term. Um, and so I hope that we actually are in a position where people can always gain this stuff because the alternative I, is the I, lockdown. I, I don't want to add that. I think it's, it's, to me, there's something wonderful that there are so many ways to not have a life. <laughs> that's, so that's sort of what goes on with that. I mean, if you sell out that cheap, that's, that's, I'm amused by that. I mean, it's, it's just, but systemically speaking, systemically speaking, it's yeah. like so we had television before, and we were all somatized staring at a at, at a rectangle. You know, so you know now we're, I think many more people are being productive than ever before, and there are a lot of people who have found more active ways to be unproductive. So, so what? Got it. I, I would add, so, yes, sir. Like, because of, I've been watching Shava over here, type questions up here on a phone in a Hunt and Peck way. And she said long questions. I wanted to address her at some point. Just like, I want to have mercy. <laughs> well, the time is now. We share a birthday. And I just want to say, if you folks had any sense of humor, the number one question here would be about legalizing marijuana. <laughs> <laughs> that show last week. <laughs> So did you want to give Jeopardy I don't know, I just the answer before she asked the question, or did you want to have Chava ask the question? Oh, I there we go. Sensing participation was a, word, it was a phrase you used. And uh, during the Dean campaign, where I was a key volunteer in Oregon at the time, and working with them, getting them online tools like training videos and things like that, um, my arch nemesis in terms of participation was, oddly enough, move on because MoveOn was circulating all of these things that were web petitions, which basically sat there and said, come to this website, sign this web petition, which we won't really send anywhere, and by the way, give us money. And people went, they signed the petition, they gave a donation to Move On, they got a sticker, and they never got off their butts and out on the street. So in terms of sensing participation, is that like the shadow of... They always wanted it to be a quote, shoe leather and mouse pad campaign um, with the aim of using the online to stir up enthusiasm, but in order to get you offline <coughs> into the street doing the, the work that has to be done door to door, and that they feel that they were not successful at that. I think this is absolutely one of the lessons that the Obama campaign learned, and they did that very, as you say, they did that very, very well. And in fact, the, uh, the, the Oregon campaign had the best shoe leather in the entire country because we decided that we were going to pretend we were a nonprofit instead of a political party. You know, I won't Mirandize you here, but uh, statutes of limitations, well, anyway. <laughs> yeah, say no more is what I'm trying to say. <laughs> it was not in violation. Oh, okay, good. So, uh, there is this broader question of yeah. whether, forgetting the politics for the moment, whether uh, online interactions are worse than real world, and so by spending time online, we're depriving ourselves yes. of actual face-to-face -face and real. Yes. Um, and I'd be interested in seeing data about that. My sense is, my own personal it, one data point, which is worth nothing, is that I, I have no friends, I never did, in the real world. <laughs> <laughs> I have a richly satisfying social life. <laughs> Man is in so the So you're saying the Kutche world, Manifesto was a cry for help. How pathetic is that? <laughs> <laughs> The online sex yeah. is awesome. <laughs> yeah. Oh, it's fascinating. Yeah. <laughs> I think there's a difference between politics and governance, between a campaign and a government. And we've seen that in Massachusetts with uh, Deval Patrick running a very, very good campaign for governor using net roots and grassroots in a way that wasn't really seen before on a state level. And then Obama doing the same thing. But both of them are not governing the same way. They're not governing. Deval Patrick has become irrelevant in this state, by and large. And Obama is not mobilizing the 13 million people that he had on his mailing list and still has in order to push through his programs in any kind of way that I can see. And I think you get locked into that particular yeah. bubble, uh, and it, it becomes very difficult. Yeah. And there may be something also there in terms of, of open source and what's happening with hardware and software in relationship to corporations. I mean, I think the next stage will be to govern the way that Dean, Patrick, Obama ran 
which becomes an entirely different exercise. And I think manufacturing in terms of open source and craft-based, all of the old kinds of things that you're talking about, which are now digitized and ephemeralized and dematerialized around the world. Okay. I, I agree with everything you just said, with a single exception of the answer to Jay-Z's question about why, which is power. Um, I think that it's easy for a campaign to work out the problems that the Obama campaign worked out, especially since there were tracks already in the snow from the Dean campaign four years before. I think solving governance is a much, much harder thing. It's a really, really big challenge. The, the entrenched bureaucracies are enormous. The, the, uh, the opposition in the form of, of the entire Beltway uh, business uh, uh, system and the way it works, the way, uh, just the way uh, goods are procured by government, for example, is very, very complex, is regulatorily uh, beyond complex in many ways. I think it's much bigger problems to solve. I don't, really, I don't, that's not about Massachusetts, that's actually at the federal level, but I imagine the same thing applies here, even if, even if Deval Patrick is being lame in some ways as a governor. I think solving the governance problem the same way is difficult. I was going to say, it may also raise the question just of innately whether the toolkit you'd want as a challenger, as an insurgent, as somebody that doesn't have easy access to the broader media may be a different one than once you happen to have been given the ticker tape parade and you've got other mechanisms or other responsibilities to what you're doing. And I don't know if that translates into the business space, too. Is it Phil? Yes. I, uh, uh, in fact, uh, uh, Doc and Joyce were at our home and six years ago last month when we suddenly agreed, wow, a president who needs the internet to get reelected has got to be our guy. And uh, so I embedded myself in the Howard Dean campaign for a week, a month, last half of 2003, and learned a lot. Uh, the answer to your question is that uh, these campaigns are run, remember the first video uh, transmission things where the guys are on the roller skates, and they go and they get a deck, they put a tape on the deck, and they run over and do this. You remember that? That's how it was actually done in the first days, uh, back in Bell South was doing that. That's how the campaigns are run. They don't have a platform. They don't have a, a web services platform. They have 45 really smart young people working literally around the clock. And if you were paying those people, it would be a budget that no organization would do. Hallie Suit and I had dinner uh, just two days before Christmas in 19, uh, 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 2003. Um, it was a Saturday night. And... Um, we, uh, I, Hallie said, you know, well, uh, I guess all the kids are going home. So I said, let's stop by. There were 45 people working at 11 o'clock on Saturday before Christmas, okay? But they had to be there because they had 17 disparate databases. Everything was done manually. You had to have five people there all the time. Now, is this a loving story of passionate kids fighting for what they like, or is it a modern-day sweatshops in which they're being given literally peanuts for their work? Uh, both. Uh -huh. But the, um, the reason is that there's a lot of money, there's a lot of romance around a presidential campaign. Notice that only a presidential campaign has so far been able to arrange this kind of thing. You don't think the open source movement or the free software movement would claim that that's the kind of passion that they get when somebody stays up all night trying to solve that last obscure and irrelevant right. puzzle? Right. But until, uh, until we give them a platform, that is a, a web services platform that's soup to nuts, um, it's not going to happen because the government can't build it. I would submit the government shouldn't even own it because the next administration is going to shut it down. I believe it's actually an easy problem that looks hard. I think it's a GRM, which is the, the sort of shadow project I've been pushing on with Doc, um, government, government relationship, relationship management. management. Where you put out a bid for the government you want. <laughs> <laughs> bid. And it's like, woohoo, Antigua. Well, not at all. Uh, <laughs> you know, government yeah, looks hard to people. The dope. <laughs> government looks hard to people because detailed uh, organization is always hard. Yeah. Uh, running government is probably easier than running GE. Yeah. Okay. But, no, but GE, we think we know how it works. We don't. Yeah. All right. The fact is that government has a proxy battle in every department of the operation every two, four, six years. Uh, and when somebody leaves, the whole staff leaves. The whole, you know, government's a very easy problem, but we have to have a platform 
that is campaign oriented because everything that happens in government is a result of a campaign. We can use yeah. these same things. Yeah. The other thing to remember in a presidential campaign is you choose your web services platform real early before you have money. Yeah. And you can't change it then. Yeah. You're stuck. All right. The same thing happened with the Obama campaign. We know the pedigree of the Obama campaign, uh, of that platform that came from blue states. Now, they spent millions running around on the roller skates, yeah. you know, plugging things in to keep it running. But they couldn't really rebuild the platform in the middle of the campaign. Yeah. All right. So until we actually build that platform, build a web service platform, purpose-built, which is actually quite straightforward. Yeah. Not technically, it's not cheap, yeah. but uh, that's part of the problem. Got it. Um, so so is, I, I want to put in just one yeah, brief David. marker. I will, I will not bore you or the crowd. With, uh, I think there's actually a really interesting and encouraging set of initiatives by the Obama administration that should make people who love the web um, happy, and I would or at least hopeful. Uh, so I would not put him exactly in the same category as our governor. But yeah. I actually fortuitously ran across the yesterday's copy of the Financial Times on my way home yesterday on the T. And inside there was a section entitled The Business of Luxury. And inside that there was a wonderful thing, which I will just read from very briefly. Okay. And there was an interview with the chairman of uh, Louis Vuitton, um, Moët Hennessy Louis Vuitton. And so he says, the internet is more and more important for both communication and how we manage our company internally. I have instant access to real time to my stores around the world. Young people seem to like the internet. We feel it as a customer service. Uh, to sell products online, and it is the greatest risk to this industry moving forward. Talks about fake products uh, being a, a problem for them, and then he says, we have to find some way to put morality online. After all, this is one of the fastest growing areas of tomorrow's economy. So this is 15 or so odd years after the web has been around. Send that man a book. Ten years after the clue train uh, has, has left the station. Uh, and this guy seems... like the internet. Uh, well, yeah, so what he's realized is, the internet seems to be a big thing. Young people seem to like it. We should really sell online, and the reporter failed to pick up that, in fact, they're shutting down their online store on the 26th of this month, and they didn't mention that. That's how clued in they are. So my question is this. What on earth is it going to take? Well, failure, yeah, no. That, that uh, failure is a very good remedy for this. Well, actually, no, they talked about failure in here. I mean, this guy has successfully steered the company through 9-11, uh, thanks, Ben, 9-11, SARS, and, I mean, this company's been around for a long time. They have probably capital reserves to fail a lot of times. What, what can you say? I mean, there's a, a complete lack of, of vision and understanding. Uh, the, undoubtedly, there are hundreds of people in his own organization who are reading that and going, Stop it! Stop saying that! Stop saying that! And there's, you know, this guy just has to basically probably go away one way or another. And it's nothing magical. Yeah, I mean, it, you know, the net's a habitat. You know, some are going to survive, some aren't. You know, you're doing very well, but that's awesome. You know, so to me, what you're doing and what other, you know, smart people who actually get the net are doing is more important than what, you know, failures like that are doing. So. To follow up on that question, could you give examples of um, companies that you think get it, that in the intervening 10 years have figured out and gotten on the clue train? And if you could make them stock picks, that would be particularly uh, <laughs> welcome. Yeah. Well, part of the problem is, I think, with that that company now is a laughable exception. And so all companies, to one degree or another, almost all co companies, have some sense of this. The fact that on retail sites you now routinely find product reviews uncensored from customers is completely counter to the previous hundred years of, of business thinking. And now it's just, yeah, of course you're going to. Because if you don't, they'll go somewhere else and it's good for people to be happy with the, what they buy. And they, that, that single thing to me is an indicator of just how far businesses have come. They haven't come far enough. The fact that IBM, so here's an iconic example. You know, IBM is the company that for a generation, actually a couple generations, defined the conservative business approach, the top-down command and control system, everybody dressed alike. That's how controlling it was. It, it was the icon of that era. And now it's doing the jams, IBM jams. In fact, they're franchising jams to other companies, where everybody in the company, 400,000 people get to talk for three days over the web. Everybody's equal. Your position doesn't matter, and you get to all have a values jam. Wait, and this is good? It sounds like you think these jams are goofy. <laughs> I think it's good. 
the fact that uh, that a company like that has has uh, the, the, they stopped developing their own web server in order because they and they took up Apache Apache instead. You know, they went open source and they contribute to open source. This is IBM. This is a change in their business model, it, as well as their culture, it is astounding and unpredictable and a sign of how deep the the change is. Is IBM the perfect example of no? But that's pretty good stuff. I think uh -huh. that. Um, the book, in fact, did change the way we thought about business. Many people thought about business and gave us a lot of energy to create some new businesses and try new things in 1999. Is that right? Is that when? And I think here we are in 2009, and I'd love to hear what you guys think. Or in, even better, here you're going to do a book to help us all start more businesses and get this absolutely deadbeat economy going. and kind of kick us all in the entrepreneurial pants, so to speak. And are you thinking about that? We're all going to buy the book today, of course. But what's your next book to get us going? We need, we need some help. Well, more immediately or shorter term, a shorter business book on uh, the nature of expertise and expertise taking on the properties of network manifesto. <laughs> so, so, I mean, this also leads to a Barbara Walters style question, which is, Clearly, part of your ethos is how to enter into a conversation. And the reason why it's so hard often for the standard canonical business you're talking about is because they hear things they don't want to hear. They work right. so long on this product, and people might not like it. And that could be true, certainly, of a book produced by people. How do you handle the negative stuff? Is there a way that you would actually want to foreground that on the website and actually have the most uh, negative words juxtaposed with the, the best ones in the interest of truth and authenticity. I, I, I like to engage them. I mean, I, 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 when, I, when I see a critic who's actually got something substantive to say, um, I, I like to, you know, call them out and talk to them about it, rather than say, you're, or, you're wrong about that, but rather see, you know, And do you have comments on your site? I mean, does your site have a blog the, with comments? The food trade itself does not. We just kind of declared it. A, well, actually, we had a, uh, a part of it where people could just sort of post comments. It was free blog. It was free blog. Contrary. Yeah, but it, well, but most of most of it did. We both have I mean, active blogs with active comments. Got it. And do you yeah. moderate those comments? No. Yes. There are a lot of you know. I mean, a if, if it's a spam. spammer or something, you know. I mean, it, some yeah. spammers get through the filter, and I'll, you know, they're, you know, they're they're not saying anything. Uh, they, they're they're trying to gain Google AdSense or something like that. Got those I, I get rid of. If, if it's something negative. Um, or, or critical, I generally I always let it through. It's not a not a not an issue, and uh, so yeah. Um, the book I wrote after this, uh, one of the reviewers said that it was as if written by a room full of monkeys, but not as good. <laughs> <laughs> Which the right answer is just wait. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to ask either or both of you, as people who are almost constantly thinking about this stuff and immersed in it. What do you see as the questions on your minds right now along these lines that remain unanswered? It's a really kind of interesting and pressing question. And see if there are thoughts among the people here about the question before we part. I don't know if either of you want to put a question out there. Well, here's, here's one, and it's a, it's a structural one. And uh, and it actually addresses the digital divide to some degree because there are many, many, many more mobile phones in the world than there are internet connections. Yeah. Something I learned from Dr. Zuckerman over here. And, uh, um, and the question is, when does the phone system become a data system and not just a phone system? I think it has to do that. I think, the, I think that's where we're going to head with it. <clears throat> I think when does the, when the cable systems become a data system? There's, in infrastructure, I think is is a is a really big open question. How do we make, you know, how do we how do we get as close to everybody networked as possible? So that's and, and I don't know an answer to that. Are you confident that when that happens, the result of the convergence of the peanut butter and the chocolate will actually be a delicious treat? Will be that essence of internet that you think the manifesto represents? rather than, at some point, the ethos of cable television or standard mobile phones will actually I, take over. I, I'm a utopian on that one. I yeah. think, and, and it's not because I think the, the net is a panacea, though I think it has wonderful 
qualities to it. It's because I think human beings are terribly resourceful. Yeah. I think people are, are, are extraordinarily resourceful. And, and if they have the tools to be more resourceful with, they're going to do creative things with them. Yeah. And I think that the, the ability of anybody to connect with anybody and do anything undermines, I mean, hyperlinks subvert hierarchy. I think, I think resourcefulness by anybody subverts hierarchy and actually allows us to create better ones. We're better off than we were a few years, uh, just a few months ago, but I do worry a great deal about the attractiveness in many ways of locked down, non-generative devices like, you know, the iPhone um, and the next generation of Apple stuff up from the iPhone where they decide the App Store is actually a pretty good model and so because it makes customers, consumers, really happy because the stuff is safe and so we go to an App Store model and we get locked down computers. It's not at all uh, a lot of, of movement in, in, at the uh, international level as well as uh, is, is exactly, from my point of view, in the wrong direction. So I remain a uh, basically a utopian who's still scared shitless. Um, could you speak about China? That was one thing that scared me shitless, was the anniversary of Tiananmen Square, where the whole collective memory of what had happened was almost erased, um, depending on whose account you believe. Well, it's despite, despite all this technology that's supposed to be able to link people together, but they were able to find technological ways to subvert people from connecting in the way that you guys seem to think is inevitable. So one of the things that I believe 10 years ago I was more of a John Perry Barlow, the internet routes around obstacles sort of person. Um, and over the past, well, I'll say at least five years, uh, I am much less uh, convinced of that. Uh, China is one very good proof point. And so maybe if you're enough of a hacker in China, you can manage to do the uplink and get your, but as a cultural thing, no, you can lock down the internet. There's been a lot of research done, really wonderful research done at the Berkman Center on exactly this question. And it's hard to remain, um, uh, it's hard for me to maintain my belief that the internet will always route around when you have so many instances in which, for most people, no, it can be locked down. So I think China is a scary in itself and a proof point and should get us working even harder to make sure that the, our internet, our internet stays free. Where our, by the way, doesn't mean American versus Chinese. I mean, the internet is ours, so. From a, a consumer perspective, and I know there are a lot of people who do digital native, um, studies in here. I'm curious if there'll be a little bit of a convergence between um, crucial companies and an upcoming generation that maybe won't tolerate the kind of lockdown technology that, that we seem to fall into so easily, but maybe there'll be a different notion about what needs to be um, unlocked in the future with the upcoming generation. I'm just wondering if, you, if maybe there's some hope for utopia um, in the kids behind us. Yes, and I, think there's, I actually think there's plenty of hope for utopia. Um, uh, absolutely, I remain utopian and, and more hopeful than, than ever, in part because of much of what I see happening in, in the new administration in the U.S. But, and I think you're absolutely right. I think it's a generational change that's going on, and it will take a full generation for that to happen. You know, Doc and I have to, have to die. <laughs> no rush. Before no rush. But no, you can stick around and be the yeah. senior elder states people of the movement that has a certain voice to it. Whether or not the kids today have that voice, I don't know. I, we have some experts on digital native but here. I, I'd like to answer the finish yeah. answering that question though, because I, I, I I'm actually very optimistic about that. Uh, I, I I think that they're in the long run locking down is not a great strategy, and I think it'll, it's going to fail in, in too many cases. I think right now we're still at a time when it still pays off enough, and, uh, and, but that's going to change, and I think it's going to change as individuals get more power. I think as individuals have the power to say, you know what, these are my terms of engagement. I don't want to sign your, your, uh, your, your lousy one-sided privacy agreement. That's one of the things we're working on. You know, what's a, what, are the, what, are the tool, what are the terms of engagement that we bring to the table? They're going to be better than the course of ones that you're hitting us with because you don't trust us. And that distrust is, is, is counterproductive. Um, I mean, I think that, you know, the Apple App Store is slick and the rest of it, but there's a, it can't scale, right? We're seeing these all the time or where they're, they're rejecting one program or another over some specious grounds and, 
you know, why have a why have a sphinc why sphincter everything? You know, that's that's kind of the way they do it. <laughs> but but I, but actually, but it's it's interesting to me that you know companies will talk an open game and play a closed one. It's 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 annoying to me that the uh, and discouraging that 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 instant messaging, for example, that the Jabber protocol XMPP has not been widely enough adopted when that's the answer to everybody having you know a different IM. Microsoft and Yahoo and Apple um, all have different IM systems even today. You know why should Yahoo have a, a proprietary IM system? It makes no sense. But that's self-defeating on their part, and it's going to be proven proven wrong. I just think that it's 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 going to fail in the long run. So. So we end with uh, predictions having to do with open and closed and top down and bottom up and whether or not we can trust the case any more than ourselves, um, as we did 10 years ago. Kind of have to. <laughs> It'll be uh, fascinating to check in 10 years from now and see what it would even mean to check in. 10 years from now, does that mean we'd all show up in an amphitheater-like room with a screen behind us or we'd finally have those uh, minority report weird holodeck thingies? I think not. That's my prediction. And you can take that to the offshore Icelandic <laughs> bank. So, um, with that, I think we owe our uh, guests a huge round of applause.